Good evening, Paul. So we have Paul Ness here in California at the Indian Wells Masters. Hi, Barry. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Yeah, so it, it's quite, uh, what's the temperature and climate out there at the moment? Uh, it, Indian Wells is in the desert, a couple of hours inland from uh, LA. So it's uh, really dry, the air is really dry. Um, and it's uh, pretty hot days and fairly cool evenings. Uh, but it's not not quite summertime yet, so it's it's still bearable. It's just uh, around about thirty during the day. Great, um, yeah. So this is just a short, uh, casual chat um, with you. Um, can you tell us a bit about your professional background as a physio and how you got involved with sports? Uh, sure. Tennis? Yeah, I've, I've been involved with tennis for a, a long, long time. This is my uh, this year was my twenty sixth Australian Open. Um, uh, and I've been a physio for 30 now. I, I was a bit shocked when I got the notification for my 30 year reunion. Um, so I, I, after graduating, I uh, worked in private practice for a few years and then decided I needed to further my skills and uh, the postgraduate diploma in sports physio had uh, just been um, run from a, a couple of years before. So I got into that, and that's the today's equivalent of the Masters in Sports Physio. Um, as part of that, we had to do some time with a national level team, uh, and I'm a Carlton supporter, so what better than ring the Carlton Physio and see if you can help out your team. So uh, I helped out for a season there, uh, and at the end of the year, he gave me a call and said that there was a job going with Tennis Australia for the Australian Open. Um, so I applied, got the job, and then for the next uh, seven years, I worked for Tennis Australia doing the week of qualifying and two weeks of main draw for the Australian Open. Um, during that time, I got to know the ATP physios um, who travelled. Uh, and in that last year of working for Tennis Australia, one of the ATP physios had asked me to do some contract work for them. So I started doing some contracting uh, anywhere between six and 12 weeks of tournaments for uh, around about the next five or six years um, and then got an offer to go full-time. Uh, so uh, for the last 14 years, uh, full-time tennis has been my primary job with a, a little bit of private practice on the side uh, when I can. Oh, wow. So um. What, what are kind of trends have you seen over the last 30 years being a physio around the management of injuries and the sport itself? Uh, I, I think with the physio research that's gone on, I think we're a lot better at recognising uh, especially chronic injuries. And I think our management of chronic injuries is much better than what it, it used to be. Um, and I think our exercise to support uh, the rehab is is a lot better than what it used to be as well. Um, uh, and the, the good thing about working at the elite level is you can quite often get a hold of these athletes as they're turning from junior into pro uh, and put in place some sort of prehab type stuff. Um, now you can't always get all the athletes, but quite often you know they'll come to you or you can talk to them, you see what they're doing and you can alter some of their programs a little bit or put them through a, an actual full screening occasionally and, and just push them in the right direction. Yeah. And would you argue it starts at the junior level where you need to start thinking about these things or is there a certain phase in their career when prehab becomes more of a priority? Um, ideally, it would be great to, to have it more at junior level. Tennis is a bit of a funny sport. Uh, it's very fragmented. Um, and uh, we pro our, our biggest problem is probably that players are considered subcontractors. So we don't really have any control over them. It's not like you've got a team of footballers or a team of cricketers and, and you can basically dictate what you need them to do. Um, you know, they come and go from tournament to tournament they have time off at various times we have a big team that goes around the world so you, you don't necessarily follow one player for many weeks in a row um, so for that reason 
that is a little bit fragmented and and also we're dealing with a, a worldwide sport and different countries have different levels of physio involvement and and knowledge um, so there, there's a lot of uh, really good spruikers out there that don't necessarily back up their treatment with results. Uh, yep. So there, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of athletes that get lost uh, along the way, which is unfortunate. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point that I was going to bring up. So I've seen a lot of them have private physios as well, and then sometimes in the media or even the commentary, um, they talk about going through these interesting regimes, health regimes or interventions to mm. optimize and prevent injury. What's your thoughts about that? And sometimes it sounds a bit uh, alternative, if you want to <laughs> say it that some way. Of it is, some of it is way out there. And uh, you just try and get a hold of those people early enough and help to direct them. Um, fortunately, we, we get to see some of the private physios and we try and develop a relationship with them. Uh, and also we have a, a university for, for the young players coming through where they do three days of education where you know, the physios talk to them, the media people talk to them, the dietitians talk to them, um, the integrity unit talks to them. So they get a lot of information and they know that as physios, we've got a lot of experience in tennis. Um, so if they want a second opinion, it's no trouble. And uh, you know, we've got a, no a lot of knowledge to draw from. Oh, great. And um, so we're quite well received as an Australian physio on the tour, our opinion, yep. you'd argue. Yes. That's yep. great. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, because uh, I, I just see a lot of even interesting diets that some of these tennis players um, oh, commit yeah. to. Let's not start on that one. Don't start on that one. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and then they, they often sort of promote it like as a health message to the world mm. that they attribute their performance or whatever it is, right? On this yeah. specific regime. It's almost like a cult type of. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of fad stuff going on. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it's better now than it used to be, but there is still some fad stuff that goes around for sure. Any of the fad stuff you would pay attention to that may become evidence-based in the future? like lagging behind, you know, substantial research that you're seeing anecdotally? Um, not much. Not much, okay. Maybe maybe some of the, the healing tools. I know uh, there's a few electrotherapy things that are thought of highly in some parts of Europe, um, but not necessarily around the rest of the world. I don't know if the research is going to back it up or not. Um, as you know, there, there's many more ways to skin a cat than just the one. So we, we can use all of our different tools and, and some people like some things and some people respond to some things and not others. Great. So you're arguing that basically the fundamentals are the same and not much has changed in terms of treatment modalities over the time? Or uh, I think, yeah. and things like that have become more um, specific and specialised? I, I think it's become more specific. Uh, yeah. And I, I think a lot uh, there's more reliance on very good hands-on than there used to be. Oh, um, yeah. And when I started, uh, quite a few people travelled with these big interferential type stim units, and they plugged four players into it at one time and thought that was fantastic, and they put ice bags on. Now it's it's very much more one-on-one -on -one and. You, you do your assessment and you really try and analyse what's going on and then treat very specifically. Um, so I, I think it has got better as far as that. And goes. do you find that's like a cultural thing too? So for example, some of the, some countries, they, they want you to put a machine on them, for example, because physio is perceived like that there. And then yeah, other probably, countries. Yeah. Probably uh, originally, I think tennis was um, serviced by the American profession athletic trainers. Right. Uh, and I don't think they were as highly trained as physios, especially Australian or British or New Zealand physios. Uh, so I think the, the level of um, professionalism in medical cover has been increasing gradually over, over that last 20 or 30 years. Great. Because I've seen some of these uh, 
athletic trainers or whatever they're titled um, use kinesio tape even now on NBA players and things. Yep. I don't see as much yep. in tennis. Maybe I've seen one or two of them have use it that, yeah, the use of that. Um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, we, we do use uh, kinesio tape and dynamic tape, uh, but it's very much, let's try it and see if you feel better with it. <laughs> okay. uh, and a lot of guys will not feel better with it, uh, but some will, so you use it. Uh, okay. that's it's very much that way uh, we use it we try it some people like it some people don't think it does anything um, sometimes it just feels more comfortable for the athlete uh, I, I don't know if the the science stacks up um, very difficult to study some of those sorts of things but uh, as you know you use all the tricks in your bag yeah. are there any particular braces that are generally used that uh, guys who have got dodgy ankles will use ankle braces uh, yeah. or tape their ankles. That, that's probably the majority. Right. And what is that specific type of uh, ankle brace they use, like an ASO one or? Uh, ASO much? or Suedo, similar to that. Um, oh, right. Different ones from around the world, whatever they find most comfortable. Yeah. And it, I've heard somewhere where you should be wearing it on the chondrolateral side too, so on both ankles, if you've sprained one. Is that relevant or not for um, no i think uh, uh some that have sprained both ankles will wear them on both ankles but uh, i think it's more just on the uh, the affected side okay and does it affect their performance at all like with the shoe fitting and things like that do you find or no 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 not at all great um so what are the common injuries do you see on tour um at the moment, uh, tennis tennis is a brutal sport, uh, especially hard courts, uh, and there's so much impact. Uh, so anything from uh, sprained ankles to sore knees and hips, lower backs. Uh, naturally, the the shoulder takes a fair pounding too. Um, I think statistically, we see uh, low back as the biggest uh, problem that we treat, um, and then shoulder and neck. Uh, but in any one day, you can you can treat just about anything. Yep. So there's nothing that pops up as a most injured body part or L lower back is is lower probably back. the most common. Yeah. And based on that, do you have any tips for social recreational tennis players to prevent back problems or reduce uh, them? It's really important to make sure that you've got the flexibility that you need to play the sport. Um, both in flexion and extension and rotation. Um, uh, aside from that, you've got to have the muscular support. So uh, a good core um, and make sure that, uh, you know, around your hips and, and legs, you've got the support from below as well. Right. And where did most people go wrong with that part when they're preparing to play? Um, I think most of our guys are pretty good uh, yep. and they will just get themselves into extremes of positions um, under load uh, and it's very difficult to avoid some injuries when, when that happens. Uh, as far as the recreational athlete goes, I think uh, probably trying to stretch too far for something um, yep. and they don't have a good base of support and they don't have the muscular control. So then they, they do a little facet joint sprain or a, a disc oh. irritation. Would you recommend yoga or Pilates or anything like that? Would that help or does it need to be more specific to the sport? Um, it depends on the person. I and mean, we have such a, a large range of people uh, who play. Uh, those who are really flexible, they, they need to make sure that their strengthening is super good and that's where your pilates can be helpful uh, and maybe not yoga that's stretching them out too much um, and then maybe the the reverse for those people who are a bit stiff they they need to make sure that they keep mobile and, and yoga can be more useful for that great and uh, is breathing a big part of it at all in injury um, management no I, I don't think so for tennis no oh, great um so there's a lot of media about 
and damaging your knees um, if you play on hard courts and singles as you get older. So for, for mm-hmm. the audience who want to play until they're 80 or so, um, do you have any tips on that? Is that true that knees tend to give in over time? Like if you play singles and on a hard court, for example, or is that? Um, I, I think there is some evidence for that, but there's also some evidence to say that if you load your joints, you will actually stimulate them as well. So uh, I think some of the arthritic studies say that loading a joint through exercise is one of the best things to help maintain uh, good joint health and uh, potentially reduce your amount of pain that you get from it. Um, Now, fortunately in Australia, we have a number of different surfaces. So you you can play on your onto car or some of the artificial grasses uh, and they are more comfortable to play on for some people. Great. And what would you recommend a recreational player in terms of frequency of playing, like to reduce the risk of injury once a week, once a month, um, or is there any particular kind of routine uh, you think would be better, f- you know, for loading their joints and fitness and overall? Uh, I, I think much, I, I think you need to be reasonably regular. So uh, if you are much less than once a week, then you're not going to continue the training benefits. Um, but then it, it's going to depend on what other activities you do around tennis, whether you go for a jog or a walk or go to the gym. Um, but yeah, if you do it too infrequently, like every second or third week, then I, I think you're, you're going to be uh, stressing yourself a fair bit and you'll end up with a, a lot of DOMS, uh, yeah. delayed onset muscle soreness. And so that, that'll make it particularly uncomfortable. So right. once, once or twice a week uh, is, is a good frequency. Those who are more competitive will, will play a little bit more than that though. And for the recreational player, what would you recommend in the warm up? Like say, for example, I've booked the tennis courts down at the local club um, for an hour. What should I be doing? Should I start playing games with hitting comp- uh, the competitor or should I be warming up half the time, hitting up, prep, you know, rehearsing some serves? Is there any tips around that you can recommend? Yeah, most people will do um, a little bit of mobility type stuff to start with, um, whether that's on the ground or just against a fence, moving the legs around, moving your back around, uh, moving the shoulder a little bit, uh, and then a, a gentle jog around the court. Uh, and then as far as actual hitting goes, um, I think most people find it effective to be close to the service line uh, and just hit very softly to whoever you're playing with. So it's it's really just going through the motions. There's no pressure through the joints and gradually you, you step back a couple of steps and, until you get to full court. Um, right. And, yeah, and you, then, take, you take your five minutes or so to really get going before you try and hit anything hard. Yep. And is there any signs you'd recommend or how you feel when you can hit things hard or is it just based on kind of, you know, feeling uh, every, warm and... Everyone has to experiment with their own bodies. Right. Um, some people like to do a really intense warm up. Like uh, we, we have some guys that uh, warm up and go through sprints and heavy bikes and that sort of thing and really start sweating before they go out on court to do their five minute warm up. Um, others like to just have a, a little bit of a stretch and be relaxed and uh, maybe have their back mobilized a little bit and then they'll just use the five minute warm up. So it, I think there's a, a lot to be said for individuality and trying to work out what works best for you. Great. Are there any home exercises you'd recommend to improve and your game and prevent injury? Uh, I think all tennis players should be doing some sort of uh, band work for their shoulders uh, to make sure that their rotator cuff is reasonably strong and they don't have any deficiencies there. Um, and then it will depend on the body makeup of the person. They, they probably should see someone to get a, a reasonable program worked out. Nutrition was? Uh, balanced diet. Balanced diet. No fad <laughs> diets, yeah. No fads, <laughs> gluten-free. Yeah. Uh, I, I think nutrition is 
misunderstood quite a lot. Um, too many people don't eat enough uh, and certainly people don't recharge their energy systems. Uh, and uh, uh, my, my wife is a nutritionist, so I, I hear a lot of this sort of thing. And if people don't eat enough just to, just to, to sustain their basic functions because they're trying to lose weight, then they'll start to affect other bodily systems adversely. Um, and women are most at risk for this because they, they can uh, muck up their hormonal systems quite significantly if they're not eating enough. Sounds strange, but sometimes you can lose more weight by eating more. Great point there. <laughs> um, so I saw you on TV at the Australian Open finals with Daniel Medvedev and uh, Rafael Nadal giving pickle yep. juice, I think. To Medvedev. Yes. Yep. That's got and a bit of press. muscle cramping. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, uh, there's all this stuff about pickle juice that came out in the media afterwards. Um, yes. Is that is that recommended for any type of sport and cramping? If um, there's some pretty good research to say that cramping is not actually anything to do with poor conditioning or anything like that. It's there, there's a neural response um, so that the message from the brain to the muscle that's cramping has gone a little bit haywire. Uh, so the way to reset that neural response is by, or one of the ways is by stimulating what's called the oropharyngeal reflex, which is something that starts at the back of your throat. So with this pickle juice what you're meant to do and you don't actually have to drink it you can just put it in your mouth and swish it around and because it tastes bad to most people it, it sort of makes you want to dry reach a little bit and that's the stimulation of the oropharyngeal reflex which is meant to interfere with that funny nervous reaction that's happening and and therefore uh, prevent the cramps or stop the cramps once they've started uh, if people are okay with actually swallowing it, then there's no real harm in that because it does have some salt in it. And quite often we do lose a lot of salt uh, while we're sweating. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really based on a more a neurophysiological thing than anything to do with the nutrition elements of uh, pickle juice. It's much more a, a reflex thing from it uh, not tasting great. Right. And um, on that point, so I see tennis players take a lot of bananas often during mm -hmm. the, the match, long matches in particular. Um, is there any particular science behind that? Why it's always the banana and not? Uh, dif different people have different uh, ranges of food that they eat. Uh, the, right. There's quite a few people that will have gels uh, that can be either hydration or um, calories. Uh, some people will have dates, bananas have been common. Uh, and I think the reason that bananas is so common is because they're fairly easy to eat uh, and they have a fairly good amount of calories in them um, to sustain you. Because they, these guys can play really long matches. Uh, so the food that you had before you started might not be enough to sustain you through the whole match. So you need to keep fueling your system. Great. So, um, yeah, that's really good answer there. Um, so last question. So if you had to sort of combine all your 30 years of experience in reflection um, and you've been working with these elite athletes, what would you share, I guess, three points to, you know, the, the, the recreational or amateur sporting, you know, tennis player um, that's not so popular? In advice, if you I could think, Google it. Yeah, I think um, one big thing is getting some good coaching to make sure that your technique is reasonably good because a, a good technique will prevent many injuries. Um, now there's, a, there's a reason that Roger Federer has not had many injuries and generally it's because he moves gracefully. Uh, uh, is fairly light on his feet and he transmits the force from legs all the way through his body, down his arm to his wrist to the racket. Uh, so if you have a good 
technique, then you're much less likely to be injured. Um, the, I think the, the next thing would be to probably consult with a reasonably good physio who's experienced in the area to see whether you do have any specific deficiencies um, in strength for shoulder or uh, core or around the, the hips, low back area. Uh, and it might be that you actually need to have some sort of conditioning program um, in place as a preventer. Uh, the, the final thing would be um, just understand what your limits are uh, and uh, don't overload yourself. Um, we, uh, we, if there's one thing I would like to have happen more with juniors and the guys that are turning pro, it would be to monitor how, how much work they do. And that'd be time on court, the intensity, the number of serves that they do per session, per day, per week, um, to make sure that they don't rapidly increase their load. Because I think when you get a, a rapid increase in load, that's when you're likely to have most trouble. Right. Um, so on those three points, what constitutes a good coach? I mean, there's heaps of them out there. Um, um, but in Australia, I think uh, most coaches would go through a, uh, if they're an accredited coach, they go through an actual coaching program. And I think Tennis Australia has got some pretty good coaching programs in place. Um, so I, I think I would trust most of the coaches yeah. in Australia to set you up with a pretty reliable, economical forehand and backhand and serve. And physio, how do you determine what is a good physio in tennis? Uh, Google. Google? Yeah, uh, yeah. find out uh, who actually works in the field or uh, ask, ask other people and get suggestions. Yep. And uh, so, so and then on, on your last point, when you're tracking it, what are you looking for? You know, the, the amount of work, um, the amount of serves and things yeah. like what you're playing. What, if, what are you trying to look for as a bad pattern, good pattern? What do you need? Well, to uh, a, a very basic thing would be uh, if you're a recreational player and you play once a week and then you all of a sudden get asked by two other people that you play with on your Tuesday night come to fill in on Wednesday and Saturday that week, you've gone from one session to three sessions. So your workload has increased a couple of hundred percent. Um, so there is a chance that maybe after that third match in the week, you're going to come up with some sort of issue, whether it be your shoulder or your back or anything else. Um, so just understanding what you've done and, and how consistent it is and, and then have you actually had an increase. Great. All right. Um, we're going to wrap it up, but thanks for your time, Paul. That was fantastic. And Pleasure. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully everyone will get something out of that. Thanks. If you uh, ever have uh, any other questions, please feel free and we can do another one. No worries. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Paul. Thanks, Barry.